Um, she's going to read a story from How to Get Rid of Pimples. It's called, uh, How to Get Rid of Pimples was published by Top Stories. Unfortunately, it's no longer print, but it's an exceptional um, book. It was actually Cookie's first book, which was published in 1984. And um, this story is called Gina, I Hear America Singing. Shelters. On the street, Gina saw a bum, 
who was naked except he was covered from head to toe in yellow paint. <laughs> she thought that he must have found in his a can of yellow curb paint and doused himself with it. He was a union caution sign, a walking no parking zone. <laughs> The bag man, Bob, attempted to build a home in a garbage can that was laying on his belly, but he couldn't fit his big butt into it. She felt as homeless as he, but a wire mesh garbage can wasn't much of a hideaway, as she saw it. She was lost in a city with bums, four abreasts on the sidewalks of every corner. It's like this in my neighborhood now. House kitchen, stay away. <laughs> <laughs> As she walked by, one of the bums screamed at her, Fashion mistake, he yelled. <laughs> she looked at him. He wasn't wearing anything at all. <laughs> she looked down at her own clothes. Was he right? <laughs> she thought she looked just fine for the city in black spandex pants and a hot pink t-shirt. Was the look too out of date, she wondered. <laughs> As she kept walking nowhere, she noticed a real, true fashion victim on the dress for the weather. The fashion victim was passing out in the middle of a street, and the light was changing to green. Oh, heat prostration, Gina thought, as she ran to lift the girl and drag her to the opposite corner. Oh, yes, it was heat prostration, all right, and the girl said, Thank you. Gina thought she had finally found a friend, but as she tried to carry on a conversation while she walked beside this girl, the fashionette told her to get lost and the tone wasn't pleasant. <laughs> oh God, said Gina, this city is merciless, but beyond my ken. Where are all the wise people? Where are the sensitive types? <laughs> the same day she came to Manhattan, she thought she'd better leave. She'd come back when it wasn't so hot. She found a ride, a ride board at New York University and went to upstate New York, where she located an ashram. She met a man in his 40s who was intent on hammering a piece of bamboo into his forehead to open a third eye. And she told him that she would help him do it because she knew that he probably wouldn't die because he was so wise. He was practically a yogi. He was almost to the point of levitation. He said he had always wanted to levitate because it was such a showpiece. It would impress even his enemies. On the night of the operation, they ate millet. <laughs> On the night of the operation, they ate millet and tahini, tamari dressing, and goat yogurt for dessert. A little later, at the first sight of blood, Gina chickened out. In a state of nausea, she left the ashram. She would never be a nurse. So, she gave up the search for wise men and settled down in the commune. <laughs> Not far from the ashram on the edge of a little river. She would spend entire days in an innumerable, oh, sorry. She would spend entire days in an inner tube, floating, following the current. One day she saw the sky, just as it had been when she used to pretend that she was at Allan Poe, but this time it wasn't darkened with chemical smoke, but with the impending rage of a storm. The clouds looked like rats. All the birds were flying low, and the cows she saw weren't standing but lying on the grass. She knew that the animals were acting strangely because of the air pressure on the coming storm. Sure enough, it began to rain so hard that the water around her was singing with the whipping it was getting. She knew she should get off the inner tube to make it to the safety of the shore, but the river wouldn't stop. Only meaner and rougher it got until she could no longer see the line of land. When the river emptied out into the larger river, she decided there wasn't much she could do, or so she just relaxed. It rained for four days and four nights, and she was sweeping past most of the eastern United States. <laughs> so it occurred to her as she entered the 
ocean that she was lost. <laughs> Big steamships passed her in the night. She got so close to them that she could see the bare light bulbs through the portholes in the end rooms. There had been no one to yell at for help in all this time, and she thought perhaps she no longer had a voice anyway. Her body was changing alarmingly, pruning up, and the skin was evolving into a quiet, rubberish-looking stuff. One day, she was caught in a tuna net with many large tunas. When the fishermen took a look at her, they threw her back, <laughs> because by this time, she had ingratiated herself with the sea. She didn't look like much of anything anymore. Certainly not human, but limp and green like some inedible ocean life from the Mesozoic epoch. Since she was still on the inner tube, she supposed that, she, that they thought she was just some green seaweedy debris attached to it. Fishermen caught tires all the time. As the tuna boat was pulling away from her, she gazed past it, past it and saw the shores of Key West, Florida. She had heard all about the gay men there, so indeed there must be some wise men dancing in the discos. But then she thought about her strange new appearance and the rejection from the fishermen. She guessed they were really the wisest bunch of men she had ever met. Finally. They knew a fish out of water when they saw one. <laughs> Perhaps they realized that she was better off being lulled by songs of whales and porpoises, adored by little fish that followed her like trained poodles. To, to reintroduce her to the human world again would only serve to show once more that there was no place for her among people. But perhaps the fishermen were merely thinking in terms of dollars, and they threw her back because she certainly wouldn't make them great for bumblebee or chicken of the sea. This was something to ponder as she bobbled on the surface of the waves in her inner tube that looked like a licorice donut but more like a comfortable nest. Perhaps she would become a seabird. That's more. <laughs> the sermon says, this, is, this book is called How to Red a Pimple, so each of these stories has a cure for the pimples at the end. The cure, uh, and there is a treatment that I should show. confirm this, the cookie did Herself. Every day that involved apple cider vinegar, vitamin E, vitamin A, and groceries, and all of this, of the whole recipe, which did seem to work. The circumstances of Gina's cure. I met Gina way back in Baltimore when I worked as a credit clerk with her. At the time, she was so ordinary that she bought a tuna sandwich on rye without the crusts, seven carrot slices, and VA juice every day for lunch from the time I met her until I left the job. Never tired of this lunch. I couldn't believe it. No variation made for a very dull person. At this time, her hair was short and she wore polyester pants, pants suits. But strangely enough, through the exterior, there glowed a very peculiar person. I couldn't quite put my finger on it. I sensed that she was uncomfortable in these clothes and, for that matter, in the company of human beings. She had a facial problem and I gave her the cure. Before I left the job, I noticed an incredible change. By the time she left for New York City, her skin had been clear for some time. So obviously, this particular skin problem had nothing to do with the fishermen rejecting her. <laughs> this story of her travels on the ocean is not substantiated by any reliable witness. I have a feeling that this tale she is so fond of telling over and over, ad nausea, is fabricated. I've seen her on the streets of New York City lately, and she doesn't look so special, but her skin is clear. <laughs>